Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. Hey Jason, I have a little bit of upper back rounding and quite a bit of butt wink when I squat ass to grass. I don't experience any pain or something. Uh, I have fairly long legs in comparison to my torso. Is this normal or do I squat just below parallel? Well, here's the situation you find yourself in. Uh, there's a certain amount of butt wink that's actually okay. A little bit of butt wink is actually not dangerous. It really isn't. Uh, I mean, the point is, is that do, does your pelvis look like your dog when he's taking a dump? Right, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for is really being excessive and bad. Now, that being said, if you have an amount of it happening, of pelvic tilt there that you're concerned about, then just squat an inch below parallel. Uh, squatting just below parallel is still going to give you maximum muscle development, right? Uh, in fact, there are some muscles like the hamstrings that might do a little bit better. And granted, I understand they're a secondary muscle. They might do a little bit better. Uh, and that will be sufficient to pass you into in any sort of competitive endeavor. However, what I will stress, though, is that you need to film yourself. Because a lot of people, um, in case in point, I had someone come on my Instagram and talk about how they were stronger than me on squats. Because I hadn't been filming my squats since I'd been rebuilding them. And they had a 405 squat that was with knee wraps that was about three inches above parallel. right? And they actually thought it was ass to grass. So make sure that you really are uh, only going about an inch below parallel and that your inch below parallel is not a half squat, uh, which again, a lot of people do that. They're bad about that. But film yourself, find that position, and just squat to there. It'll be fine. You'll pass in powerlifting meets, strength lifting meets. Pretty much no one will question your depth, uh, and it will still allow for building maximum size and strength. It's not a problem. Not everyone is built to go ass to grass. All right, next question. How do you personally determine how many calories you burn day to day? And how do you determine how many you need to eat for specific goals? I don't care if this doesn't make sense. The video, I would just love a reply. I recently got a bod pod scan and I was wondering how much you advise trusting the results uh, these kinds of things provide you. It tells you your muscle mass, body fat percentage, needed calories for different activity levels, etc. Thank you. Here's what the machine looks like to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And he posted a picture there. Uh, no, they're not that particularly reliable uh, because, again, your activity level varies from day to day. And that's the problem we run into. Uh, calorie intake is an estimation. Now, if you're good at stuff and tracking things, it's a pretty good estimation. But let's be honest here. You don't actually know for a fact how many calories you eat a day. And I hate to tell that to the people with the eating disorder who break out the digital scale for everything. Uh, your food is plus or minus 10%. So it doesn't matter that you weighed that rice to a gram because you can't control the amount of moisture in it. So your 3,000 calories a day, if you're, if you're ac accurately measuring everything, is plus or minus 10%. So it's actually 2,700 to 3,300 if you measured it all correctly. It's just an estimate. Just like your burn is an estimate. Uh, and your activity levels are going to vary day to day. So the point is, unless you are very specifically for weight class reasons or photo shoot reasons having to control this stuff, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to nail it down. Because I can tell you right now, you can't afford the technology. And it's not practical for you to be able to use the technology that will uh, really tell you how many calories you burn a day. And that's okay. Just consume a given amount, track it loosely, and see if the scale is moving up or down. And then you can determine roughly how far off you are. But you need to understand if your activity changes from week to week due to your work, some other outside endeavors or whatever, you may need to just throw in some extra calories or reduce some extra calories just based on that For if you're trying to maintain a certain body weight or maintain a certain amount of weight gain or weight loss. Um, now, I personally would tell a lot of people, I think you don't need to worry about all that stuff that tightly. There are things you can do with your diet to just kind of keep yourself moving in a certain direction and you can kind of train and eat to your appetite. But that's a far, far more complicated matter, far more complicated matter. Uh, but for the most part, you need to understand this is a ballpark estimate. You are not going to live in a metabolic ward in a sealed room 24-7 to track your calorie intake. That bot pod's not accurate enough to get you that close, really. It's not because you can't track your daily activity as closely and you can't nail your caloric intake down perfectly. You're just trying to get a guesstimate so that you can roughly control your body weight. That's about all you can do. And it's not worth obsessing over until you have serious money or something involved with it. 
All right, next question. What do you think of cluster sets with 85 through 90% of one rep max, such as four sets of 333 with 15 to 20 seconds between triples versus basic straight sets like three by five? Uh, I'm sorry, your math has got to be off. There is no way in hell you are doing three sets of three with 20 seconds between sets with 85 to 90 percent of your one rep max uh your one rep max estimate is way 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 off like that's not even physically possible <laughs> it's not even physically possible to do that uh 75 percent maybe you can do it with 75 percent maybe if you're really conditioned 80 percent but 85 to 90 percent no and if you're able to only take 20 seconds between triples, you need to be going heavier anyways and take longer breaks. We have plenty of data showing that you gain more muscle and more strength if you're able to lift heavier on subsequent sets due to longer breaks. The only issue becomes time economy, not effectiveness. So that's what you need to understand. That's all you're balancing out with rest times in the gym is how much time can you allocate to sitting around the gym waiting between sets versus your goals because longer breaks produce superior results there's pretty good data on it at this point even guys like dr brad are agreeing it's better for hypertrophy and he still promotes some fluff and pump so put that in perspective uh all right next question if learning olympic lifts power variants not done with the anticipation of competing only for power development and general athleticism uh, is more of a priority? Is it a better idea to do the clean to snatches before squats in a Bulgarian style training program? No, absolutely not. Do them after. Do them after your squats are a more important overall exercise. You're going to lift a heavier weight. It's going to be more taxing on the body. It's going to have more eccentric problems. Uh, you need to squat first. Squat first and then do the cleans and snatches afterwards, particularly if we're talking about training them purely for overall explosiveness. Like again, you're doing power cleans, power snatches, instead of a full clean or a Olympic style snatch where you're squatting all the way deep and everything on them. No, no, no. Do them afterwards, do them afterwards. Your squat's the more important exercise for your goals. It needs to take a higher priority in your training if you're just trying to get big and strong. These are, are more secondary exercises for that goal if you're not gonna be an actual Olympic lifter. Uh, so yeah, do them afterwards. All right, next question. Jason, how to train in order to achieve a physique similar to Chris Hemsworth in Thor and the Avengers movies? From what I've seen, his body's strong points are primarily the shoulders, back, chest, and especially the arms, but his lower body is pretty small. He is a tall individual, but how to achieve a similar look if you're shorter? Thanks, Jason. All right, guys, all these superheroes uh, that you've been seeing in these movies, now that their trainers are releasing what they're doing, they're doing five by fives and they're doing big barbell lifts. That's mostly what they're doing. How do you achieve a physique like that? Uh, you need to go on a quality diet with plenty of carbs, lots of protein, lots and lots of protein probably because you want to change fairly quickly. Uh, and you need to be doing heavy barbell movements and weighted body weight exercises. That's how these guys built these things. There's a reason I promote that style of training even for guys who aren't strength athletes because that is what it's turning out lately. I've done several videos on this. Several of these actors who built these big rugged physiques, that's how they built them in a short period of time. Now they probably have drugs and stuff in the mix, but they're having them come in and do moderately heavy work on big lifts, squats, deadlifts, bench presses, overhead press, rows, chin-ups. That's how you get there. It's the same thing Martin Burkham told you, same thing the Golden One tells you, same thing I'm telling you. That's what they're doing now. Their trainers have been releasing the stuff. That's what it is combined with GPP work, right? That's how they're doing it. It's that simple. All right, next question and last question of the week. Hey, why do you think deadlifting first before any other exercise is a bad idea? Uh, simply put, my answer is twofold in nature. Number one, Number one, deadlift fatigues your lower back more than just about any other exercise. Uh, what other big lifts are you going to do? You're probably going to do squatting or standing presses, things like that. If your lower back is fatigued for those, you're more likely to get injured. Uh, yeah, in particular, the overhead press. Uh, it's a big one, too. That's why every program out there that includes those has you do the deadlift afterwards. In other words, you can still pull fairly heavy fatigued from other lifts. You, could, you probably only lose a few percentages of your strength, but you do lose some. But it's still 
copes just fine because most of us aren't pulling with really high volume. We're not using it as a primary size builder. It's being used to fill in the gaps and to get stronger at the deadlift. It will be okay. Whereas in the deadlift fatigue can lead to injuries on other big exercises. Number two, uh, when we think of the deadlift as a competitive exercise, you know, you get lots of people like, oh man, and fresh in the gym, I pulled 600 pounds and this guy over here at a powerlifting meet or whatever competition, he only pulled 590. I must be way stronger than him. Uh, no, because if you didn't squat and bench press to maxes before you hit that deadlift, that is not a true indicator of how strong you are versus that guy who did that in comp. And pretty much every strength sport in which you deadlift, you deadlift fatigued. It is never the first exercise you do unless you do a deadlift only competition. And if you do a deadlift only competition, it goes into a different set of records, right? Why is that? Because you did it fresh. And the other guys who do it in competition didn't. So by that same token, if you ever do plan on competing in a strength sport and you hit all these amazing gym lifts on a deadlift by doing it first in a routine or having its own day of the week, don't be surprised when you bomb out and miss your gym lift in competition. This has happened to multiple YouTubers who went and did their first powerlifting meet. Uh, so again, it's multifold in nature, my reason for saying that. Number one, it's just about injury prevention and balancing exercises. Number two, it's about if you are ever going to compare your deadlift to other people, you need to understand that their deadlift is usually fatigued and you may not be as strong compared to someone else as you think you are and it'll create a, a misconception of your strength. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.